Hello dear students, this is Dr. Smita Nayak, once again back with the very interesting and absorbing topic of pellets. I am sure all of you have heard the, uh, heard the word pellets in some context or the other. In my today's lecture, I am going to give you an overview of pharmaceutical pellets, their uses, applications, and methods of manufacture. It has been seen that in recent years, there has been a growing interest in the field of pelletization uh, using which we can produce spherical pellets that can further be changed into a dosage form such as a tab capsule. Here you can see Interesting application of pellets. The colorful pellets can be filled into capsules and marketed as a unit dosage form. Thus, pelletization involves change uh, manufacture of pellets and ultimate incorporation of these pellets into tablets or capsules. There are several reasons several therapeutic applications as well as technical advantages associated with such pellets. These include enhanced drug absorption, less gastric irritation, less incidences of dose dumping, good flowability, high tensile strength, low friability, etc. which we will see as we go further along this chapter. Okay, so today's topic is all about pellets, pelletization technology, methods, applications and their use. Okay, we first start with the definition of pellets. Pellets can be defined as small, free-flowing, spherical particulate matter manufactured mainly by agglomeration of fine powder and granules which contain drug substances as well as excipients. The typical size of the pellet ranges from a diameter of 0.5 mm to around 1.5 to 2 mm. And these are manufactured by using appropriate processing equipment. What are the applications of such spherical pellets or crystals in power? They are mainly used for increasing solubility and dissolution rate of poorly soluble drugs. These, are these can be used for masking the bitter taste of drugs. So once the drugs are converted into pellets, the amount of drug that comes into contact with the taste buds is minimal. Thus, the bitter taste can be masked. Additionally, these pellets can also be coated to mask the bitter taste. Conversion of powder into pellets improves the flowability as well as compressibility if we want to formulate them further into tablets. The overall cost of production of pellets is reduced because of the several advantages that it offers. Further, pellets can be used and designed in such a way that they provide different release profiles at the same site or at different sites in the GI, GI tract. Thus, if a drug, single drug or a combination of drugs is converted into pellets, the release rates of these can be modified by suitable techniques. Localized irritation of the drug can be avoided since all the drug is not released at once. Two or more drugs which are incompatible with each other can be delivered in the same dosage form simply by converting them into different pellets which are then combined together in either in a tablet form or in a capsule form. Conversion to pellets helps in masking the bitter taste of the drug. 
such pellets can also be used to design a sustained release formulation or an enteric release formulation these pellets are responsible for increasing the bioavailability of the drug as well as uniformity in drug absorption throughout the gi tract one of the major advantages of pellets is that because the drug is in, encapsulated in a pellet the uh, incidences of dose dumping are minimized also incomplete drug release can be avoided by designing the pellets appropriately due to all the above advantages it has been observed that pellets have better patient compliance also such pellets have lesser tendency of adhering to the esophagus during swallowing and thus the entire dose reaches the stomach there has been reports or there have been reports of reduction in inter subject as well as intra subject variability in drug absorption thus in conclusion you can see that several advantages are available if the formulation primary formulation is a pellet which is then further converted into a secondary formulation that can be administered to the patient pellets however suffer from several disadvantages uh, one of the most important disadvantage is that uh, not all kinds of pellets can be compressed into tablets during the compression cycle pellets may get damaged or the pellets may break because generally the pellets that are formed are very rigid if so if not possible to convert into uh, tablets pellets should be encapsulated in capsule just like i showed you on the title slide the production of pellets is an expensive process and requires highly specialized equipment so unless the cost justifies the need for pellets pellets are not preferred control of production process is quite difficult that is for example the amount of water to be added becomes very critical because if you add less amount of water during processing then the pellets are brittle and if more amount of water is added then a sticky dough is formed and free flowing pellets are not formed thus we have looked at the definition of pellets we have looked at the advantages of pellets and we have understood the major drawbacks of such pellets let us move forward to understand the formulation aspects of pellets what exactly uh, goes inside these pellets as you know it is the active ingredient which is necessarily to be present within the pellet there may be one active ingredient there may be two active ingredients if there are two or more active ingredients which are compatible with each other they may be combined uh, together and all pellets would contain all the drug however if the two actives are incompatible with each other and they need to be separated in that case two sets of pellets are manufactured one set containing drug a and the second set containing drug b and then both these types of pellets which are let us say color coded you have drug a is green pellets are green and drug b pellets are blue so the green and blue pellets are physically mixed together gently and then the free flowing blend of pellets is incorporated into hard gelatin capsules or maybe soft gelatin capsules so we have active ingredient or active ingredients present the second most important and uh, the maximum weight of uh, excipient is that of a filler fillers are what may be water soluble or water insoluble substances additives or excipients that are incorporated into the pellet formulation and which are responsible for giving the size to the and weight to the pellet 
selection of the filler here is similar to selection of the filler for tablets it should be based on the overall proper desirable properties of the pellets as well as compatibility with the api depending on the desired dose physical properties of the drug and the manufacturing process involved the amount of filler that goes into each pellet can be as high as 99% or maybe as low as 1%. If the filler component is uh, volume is very high, let's say more than 25% or more than 50%, then the, it is the properties of the filler which determine the properties of the pellets. Okay. So, what, how uh, hard is the pellet, how uh, fast it will disintegrate, or how well the binder will hold the uh, excipients together will depend on the filler rather than the api where the the filler volume is very large thus we have the api in powder form we have the filler in powder form and we want to convert them into spherical particles with 2 mm diameter so one of the necessary components for this is the binder so binders are adhesive materials similar to the binders that are used in tablets whose function which is incorporated into the pellet formulation and whose function is to bind the powders, convert it into pellets and maintain the integrity of the pellets. These are very essential components of pellet formulation. Next we have lubricants whose sole purpose is to reduce the friction between the individual particles and allow them to flow freely even when they rub against each other. Thus, lubricants are substances that are incorporated in pellet formulations to reduce the coefficient of friction between individual particles or between particles and the processing equipment. Because of the very nature of the uh, pellets, which is tiny, spherical and the processing involved, there is a high chance that as the pellets are formed and they are still wet, they stick to each other. So, what will happen is as they stick to each other, a lump is formed, an aggregate of pellets is formed, which uh, if undetected and undergoes drying, will lead to a mass of uh, the powder mass of pellets which is not free flowing and which cannot be filled into the uh, capsule which it so by breaking down these pellets we will end up damaging these pellets and thus distorting their flow properties so to avoid the sticking of pellets to each other during the processing stage uh, certain agents are added and these agents are called as separating agents the sole function of these separating agents is to get absorbed onto the surface of the pellets and promote the separation of the pellets into distinct units that will undergo drying. So, pellet, individual pellets are maintained independently by the use of separating agent. Another uh, reason for use of separating agent is that pellets may develop surface charges during manufacture and if oppositely charged pellets come close to each other they tend to attract one another by using separating agent we are ensuring that the stickiness on the surface of the pellets does not uh, result in sticking of the pellets to each other or when charges are developed on the surface of the pellets oppositely charged pellets are not attracted to each other the surface of the pellets is neutralized by such separating agents as in case of tablets which have to open up once they enter the gi tract and this function is aided by the use of disintegrants similarly in case of pellets disintegrants are equally important and they play the same role here disintegrants are substances 
which will promote the disruption of the solid dosage form and whose function is to regenerate that is uh, take the pellets back to the primary particulate form so that the drug powder is released and is available for dissolution and further absorption. Thus, disintegrants play an important role in ensuring the availability of the drug from the dosage form to the GI, uh, GI fluid where the drug is dissolved and then subsequently absorbed. These are a new category of uh, agents that are not present in the tablet formulation. That is the pH adjuster. pH adjusters are substances that are incorporated in the pellet formulation and their function is to influence the micro environment of the drug molecules for a number of re uh, reasons. Now, what does this word mean, micro-environment? Whenever the pellets are released into the GI fluid, these pellets are surrounded by the GI fluid. So, uh, as in, uh, wherever they are released, they are subjected to acidic media or alkaline media. They are subjected to the presence of gastric uh, acid or enzymes or bile salts which influences the release of drug from the pellet. If we want to ensure steady uniform rate, uh, release rate of the drug, then we have to modify this environment around the pellet, which is also called as the microenvironment. And we can prevent the influence of the uh, pH that is seen in the gastric fluid or in the intestinal fluid by the use of what are called as pH adjusters. So let us see what role the pH adjuster plays. Generally, acid labile compounds, that is acid sensitive compounds, are protected from the acidic regions of the GI tract through the application of an enteric film coat. So we are aware of enteric film coating of tablets wherein the tablets are coated with a polymer such as cellulose acetate palette whose function is that the film does not disintegrate, does not release the drug in the acidic fluid. Rather, the drug is released in the alkaline fluid. So, he, similarly, here too, the uh, pH adjuster is used, uh, the, the enteric uh, coat is uh, applied onto the pellet and this acts as a pH adjuster and this does not allow the drug to be released in the acidic environment. Rather, the drug is released in the small intestine. Uh, buffer systems can also be added to the core of the tablets to maintain the pH within the pellet, not the tablet, sorry, within the pellet and if uh, if necessary this will help in improve uh, can this can be used to improve the stability of the drug within the pellet we next come to surfactants which play an important role in almost every formulation surfactants are used in pellets for the same reasons that they are used in any other dosage form that means improve wettability enhance dissolution rate of especially where the drug is poorly soluble or the drug is hydrophobic okay so this is the role that is played by surfactants and surfactants are an important category of excipients as far as pellets are concerned next we come to a specialized category of excipient that is called as spheronization enhancers now, what is spheronization? Spheronization means production of spherical pellets, which I showed you on my title slide. So, those small pellets which are formed, uh, their production is enhanced by using a spheronization enhancer as a formulation aid. And this helps in production of spherical pellets and especially during spheronization. These substances not only confer plasticity on the formulation, 
so as to give good spheres but also impart binding properties so plasticity and binding properties which are essential for getting spherical pellets are this is enhanced by the use of spheronization enhancers Finally, we come to glidants or lubricants which are necessary as it is important to have good flow characteristics. Good flow characteristics play a very important role during powder layering which we will study uh, as we go ahead. The process requires a well controlled powder feed rate to balance the simultaneous application of binder solution. It is necessary that the powder or the API does not adhere to the sides of the hopper and form the uh, bridges or rat holes. Hence, glidants are very important. Now, in the next few slides, we will look at the major techniques of pelletization and the different equipment that are required for commercial manufacture of pellets. So, we will start with the very first technique, most commonly used technique in the pharma industry for manufacture of pellets, that is the extrusion spheronization technique. Then we will look into the layering technique, which we just read about briefly in the previous slide. And finally, we will come to the globulation technique, also used for pelletization. Extrusion spheronization, you can use the words together with a hyphen in between or a slash in between. It is a multi-stage process and a common technique that is widely used for manufacture of uniform sized pellets and involves multiple steps. Okay, so we are going to look at these uh, multiple steps uh, as we go ahead. What are the steps involved? The steps involved are dry mixing, extrusion, spheronization, drying and screening. And we will look at this one by one. Thus, extrusion spheronization is a, a multi-step process of wet mass extrusion followed by spheronization to produce the pellets. As we know, there are a list of excipients that are used in the making of pellets, right from API to filler to up to lubricant. Therefore, we, the first step involves mixing of uh, the, all the ingredients except the lubricant in order to achieve a homogeneous powder dispersion. The binder is also added in the dry mix and then the next step involves wet massing wherein the uh, water or suitable solvent is added and the powders are wet mixed to form a suitably plastic mass. So we have a plastic mass, a dough like mass, uh, the similar to the one we prepare in case of tablet granules. So just before granulation, we are doing mixing, addition of binder and getting a wet mass which we pass through sieve number 10. Here, now the step is different. Once the met, wet mass is achieved, then the wet mass is extruded. That means it is pulled or shaped into tiny cylindrical segments having a uniform diameter as small as 0 0.5 to 2 mm. So, once again, the wet mass is divided into long cylinders with a cross-sectional diameter of around uh, 1 to 2 millimeters and we get extremely small cylinders. So, the dough, wet dough is extruded into small cylindrical segments which are further converted into spheres in the spheronization stage. So, this is a stage where these small cylinders that we have just manufactured during extrusion are rolled into small solid spheres or spheroids. But these spheroids are wet in nature. The moisture is still there. So, they need to be dried. And the next step is drying of the spheroids in order to achieve the desired final moisture content. 
finally there is an optional step of screening which may be carried out if we need a narrow size distribution of the pellets all these steps are mentioned in brief in a very good manner in the references that i have uploaded on the teachment app so i request all of you to go through my notes on teachment app the review papers on teachment app and understand for yourself what is the exact principle behind extrusion spheronization what are the equipments involved okay now in the next slide i am going to show you in brief the equipments that are used for each of this stage the very first stage is formation of a dry mixing followed by formation of a wet dough this wet dough is now extruded in this manner into long cylinders which are cut into smaller cylindrical segments and these cylindrical segments now undergo rolling and spheronization and are ultimately converted into wet spheres or pellets i hope the diagrammatic representation here is adequate for you to understand what exactly is happening so we have a wet dough mass which is added to the extruder which extrudes the wet dough in the form of cylind long cylindrical segments with a cross sectional diameter of anywhere between 0.5 to point uh, sorry 2 mm and now these are further cut with the help of sharp knives to get cylindrical segments these cylindrical segments undergo rolling in the spheronization and they start becoming spherical ultimately they form spheres or pellets these pellets are still wet because of the solvent and they proceed further for the stage of drying so this is the principle and the mechanism behind manufacture of pellets by extrusion spheronization process i hope the whole process is clear to you and can be visualized i will also upload a couple of youtube video links on pelletization and extrusion spheronization for your reference let us see now the equipments that can be used for the manufacture of pellets the first step here is preparation of the wet mass as this process is similar to the wet uh, similar to the wet mass for uh, tablets the equipments used are similar to the equipments used in the granulation process of tablets thus preparation of the plastic mass or wet mass of the material is the first step wherein you can use different types of granulators so you have a powder blend and a granulation liquid which could be water or binding solution and simple granulator such as planetary mixer high shear mixer or sigma blade mixer etc can be used the twin screw extruder uh, is an equipment which has an advantage where the wet granulation can be carried out continuously that is the operation is not batch wise keep on adding dry powder to the extruder followed by the binding solution as the uh, granules uh, wet mass is formed and it moves forward you continue addition of dry blend as well as the binding solution so continuously the wet mass is being produced then comes the step of extrusion where the wet mass is converted into long cylindrical uh, long cylindrical segments so the prepared mass now undergoes extrusion process in which pressure is applied to a mass of particles until it flows out through an orifice producing the extrudate now the extrudate that comes out of the extruder is going to look similar to noodles right long with but with a much thinner diameter the extrudate length uh, will vary and will depend on the physical characteristics of the material that is present in the extruder there are five main classes of extruders called as the screw ex extruder the sieve extruder 
the basket extruder the roll extruder and the ram extruder which we will see in a diagrammatic representation on the next slide now you can see two figures here figure a which shows an axial screw extruder and figure b which shows a radial screw extruder let us see figure a first in the axial extruder the screen through which the wet mass is uh, passed and forms the cylinders is placed at the end of the screw so this is the screw which is continuously pushing the wet mass the wet mass is fed through the hopper it falls onto the screws because of the direction of the screws the wet mass keeps getting pushed ahead and under pressure it comes out through the screen in the form of cylinders and this screen is placed perpendicular to the axis of the screw hence such a screw extruder is called as an axial screw extruder okay so once again let me just make this uh, uh, clear to you uh, the screw extruders are used for extruding the wet mass into the uh, into the form of cylindrical segments and how this happens is by using axial type of screw extruder or a radial type of screw extruder in the axial type of uh, screw extruder the powder the wet mass is fed onto these screws which are rotating in a clockwise direction the screws are so designed that the powder the wet mass flows outwards towards the screen or the seam which has fixed apertures it then comes out through this fixed apertures in the form of long cylinders in case of the radial screw extruder the screen is placed here you can see the screen screen is placed around the screw so you have the screw you have the feed hopper you have the screw the screw is pushing the wet mass ahead and as it reaches this region it is forced outwards in the form of cylinder through these apertures which are present all around the screw so the screen is placed it the screen is a round cylindrical structure hollow cylindrical structure placed all around the screw and the extruded is extruded perpendicular to the axis of the screw this is where the extruded is coming out in the form of cylinders in the previous slide we looked at the screw extruder of which there were two types the axial uh, screw extruder and the radial screw extruder now we come to the sieve extruder in the sieve extruder a rotating or oscillating arm you can see in the center presses the material through the sieve so you have you don't have a screw here you have a arm here a cylindrical arm which is rotating the wet mass is fed from here and it is pressed by this arm and it comes out the wet mass comes out in the form of cylinders thin cylinders through the sieve that is attached at the bottom you can see a cross section so this is the arm the arm is having there are two arms actually which which press the wet mass downwards resulting in the formation of long thin cylinders and then there is this basket extruder which is similar to sieve extruder but the screen the sieve or the screen is not at the bottom instead it is present at the sides so it is a part of the vertical cylindrical wall so the feed so the wet mass is fed from here and it is extruded out in the form of thin cylinders from both the sides and this is horizontal to the uh, ground okay so whether you use a screw extruder sieve type of extruder or a basket type of extruder or any other type of extruder the ultimate aim is to 
convert the wet mass which contains the drug plus filler plus other excipients into long thin cylinders which will further be cut into cylindrical section. The next step involves the cutting of these long cylinders into short cylindrical sections and further rounding off the edges to give us perfectly spherical pellets. So this process is called as spheronization. In spheronization, the extruded cylinders are uniformly broken into a particular length and then gradually converted into spherical shape. And this sphere shaping, spherical shaping is nothing but plastic deformation of that cylinder. So the extrudates are first broken into nearly uniform length and spheres with uniform diameter are obtained. And this process is carried out in a spheronizer. So let us now look at the what is the spheronizer and how it functions in carrying out these tasks. Spheronizer is an instrument which has a vertical hollow cylinder with a horizontal rotating disc. Let me just take you forward to show the diagram. Here you can see that it consists of a vertical hollow cylinder, this one, and a horizontal rotating disc. So you can see the, the base, the horizontal base is spherical and it rotates around this vertical cylinder. Okay. So let me just uh, go back once. We have seen what the spheronizer looks like. Now the extrudates that were formed by the extruder are fed onto the rotating plate and are broken into short pieces by contact with the disc which rotates. The collision between the particles and also collisions with the wall device. The cylinders are charged onto this plate which is rotating. And as they fall onto the rotating disc, as they pass along the walls and they come in contact with the walls and they collide with each other, the long cylinders are broken down into short cylindrical sections. The mechanical energy for this breakdown is supplied by the spinning of this rotating disc. As you can see, it is spinning in a counterclockwise direction. And this is converted into kinetic energy. So the particles are thrown against the wall and they again they come into the center. They come in contact with each other and slowly as the rotation of this uh, process continues, the extrudate now, the, which has been cut into fine uh, cylindrical sections, small cylindrical sections, slowly starts deforming and ultimately forms spheroids or pellets. Thus, in the spheronizer, the cutting of the cylindri long cylinders into cylindrical sections and their defor plastic deformation into spheroids or pellets takes place and what is responsible for this is the rotating motion of the rotating disc because of which mechanical energy the spinning of the rotating disc supplies mechanical energy which is converted into kinetical energy leading to breakdown of the cylinders into short cylindrical sections and their deformation into round spherical pellets. The factors that are responsible for giving us the good pellets and the type and nature of pellets will depend upon the following factors. Rheology of the powders that were mixed together, moisture content of the pellets, the wet pellets as well as the final dried pellets, the composition of the granulating fluid, what is the binder used, what is the concentration of the binder used, the physical properties of all the materials that have been used in this exercise, speed of spheronization, 
extent to which the drug and the excipients are soluble in the granulating fluid the drying temperature and drying technique parameters and the size of the extrusion screen the process of extrusion spheronization suffers from several disadvantages a few of them are mentioned here because of the technique that is the cylindrical sections are thrown against the wall where they break down and eventually because of the rolling and the friction and the kinetic energy they are deformed into spheres this movement and this action or this methodology is also responsible for fracture of spheres where the quality of the pellets is not good the extruded that is the cylinders that are formed are not sufficiently dense if the process is not uh, if if the process is not carried out correctly then the extrudates are not dense so hollow spheres are produced the whole momentum of this processing is very slow and this can lead to sticking of the pellets to each other the pellets that are formed have minimum porosity and therefore the release of drug from these pellets and their subsequent bioavailability may be affected because of the slow momentum and the use of binding solution if the processing is not proper then sticking is seen on the friction plate that is the rotating this as well as the walls of this bowl addition of lubricant can help in reduce the problems of sticking however lubricant will increase the amount of fine dust during the processing and this can lead to health and safety hazards as well as contamination if two products are being manufactured simultaneously side by side the common applications of such pellets are for uh, immediate release pellets for sustained release pellets matrix type of pellets for making extended release pellets for making self emulsifying pellets and for manufacture of colon targeting pellets one of the most common applications of uh, these pellets is to uh, manuf uh, manufacture omeprazole pellets omeprazole is an uh, is a antacid which has to be enteric coated so it is first converted into pellets which are enteric coated and then these are filled into capsules and administered to the patient several other drugs have found uh, good uh, applications for pellets and you can see a few examples here in my slide just go through the drugs which are uh, manufactured and pellet form and finally marketed as tablet or capsule we have looked at the most important technique of manufacture of pellets that is extrusion spheronization we have seen the principle of extrusion spheronization followed by the equipments used for extrusion as well as spheronization now we will move further to the next two techniques that is the technique of layering and the technique of globulation thus we have three important techniques uh, which we are going to study for pelletization extrusion spheronization layering and globulation let us move forward layering is a very simple well controlled and straightforward pelletization technique that has been exist in existence over a number of years you can carry out three types of layering a solution layering suspension layering and powder layering solution and suspension layering involves the manufacture of drug solution or drug suspension and then deposition of the successive layers of this drug solution or suspension on to starting inert material which could be a pellet or a seed or a crystal or a granule so the basic principle here is the starting material is a pellet it's a pellet or a crystal or a seed 
which is inert. So it is made up only of excipients. And on the surface of this is being introduced the drug layer or the drug solution. Okay. So this is done by spraying a solution of the drug or a suspension of the drug or the drug powder onto the surface of this pellet. This process is called as layering. So we have solution type of layering where the drug is in solution form, suspension type of layering where the drug is in suspension form and the drug in powder form which is coated or absorbed onto the surface of an inert pellet crystal or granule. Let's see how this processing is done. During solution and suspension layering, all the components of the formulation are dissolved or suspended in a medium, a liquid medium and thus the solid content or the viscosity of the liquid is responsible for the coating. So the solution or suspension is sprayed onto the product that is the inert pellets. The droplets of solution or suspension impinge that is fall on this pellets, inert pellets uh, or they may be sprayed evenly on the surface and then they are dried. So drying conditions are very important and the viscosity of the solution or the solid concentration of the suspension has to be adjusted to give a good coating process. This is followed by a drying phase wherein the coated pellets are now allowed to dry. So the dissolved material, so the uh, solution, uh, the solvent from the solution evaporates and the API crystallizes and forms solid bridges between the core and the out, uh, outer layer of the drug as well as the successive layers of the drug substance. This process continues until the desired layers of the drug are coated onto the inert pellets and the target potency of the pellets is achieved. So this is a very simple coating process in which an inert uh, core is coated with the drug solution multiple layers of the drug solution and then allowed to dry so that the drug that is present in this uh, solution gets crystallized deposited onto the surface of the inert core and they form bridges so bridges uh, let me show the bridges in this one so bridges are formed so the inert layer coated with drug solid drug is the ultimate result So we've completed the uh, looking at the extrusion spheronization process of pelletization. We have seen the layering process of pelletization, a very simple technique. No specialized equipment is required. Now we will look at what is globulation or formation of globules. There are two globulation techniques. One is called as spray drying and the other is called as spray congealing. In spray drying, the, two, the word itself is self-explanatory. The drug in solution or suspension is sprayed into a hot air st st stream to generate dry and highly spherical particles. So the drug solution or drug suspension is sprayed from top into a hot air stream. Now this drug solution may contain only drug or it may contain drug plus other excipients which are necessary to impart the desirable properties and this solution or this suspension is sprayed into a hot air stream. So that means the solvent used here has to be volatile or the temperature into which it is sprayed has to be higher than the boiling point of this solution. The solvent is removed and what remains behind is uniformly shaped spheres or pellets. In spray congealing process, the drug is first melted and it is dissolved or dispersed in a melt of gums or waxes or fatty acids or a combination of this. So you have an oily fatty solution of drug. So the drug is lipophilic. 
in a combination of fats, acids, uh, fats, waxes, oils, etc. And this solution is sprayed into an air chamber where cool air is circulated. So in spray drying, hot air was circulated in the chamber and was responsible for removal of the solvent. In spray congealing, uh, cold air is circulated in the chamber and this cold air is responsible for hardening the melt, the base of which is a gum, fat, wax, etc. So, the temperature is well below the melting point of the formulation component and is so low that hardening of this melt takes place. And under appropriate processing conditions, spherical congealed pellets are obtained. Okay. So, formation of globules or globulation can be achieved by the spray drying technique or the spray congealing technique. We have looked at the different techniques of manufacture of pellets, the important equipments and instruments uh, responsible for manufacture of good quality pellets. Further, once the pellets are manufactured, they are either cooled or they are passed to hot air or the moisture is removed by other techniques. The pellets undergo evaluation and characterization. Some of the important tests involved in evaluation of pellets is the analysis of the particle size of these pellets, evaluation of the micrometric properties of the pellets, which includes the angle of repose, Karp's index, Hausner's ratio, friability, pellet sphericity test, etc. Further, compatibility studies. FTIR studies are also necessary in order to finalize the pellet formulation. Then the yield, percent yield of these pellets, uh, assay or drug content and surface mor morphology are, are other important tests that are carried out as a part of the evaluation process of pellets. So with this, I complete the topic of pellets. And I will forward to you a couple of important videos which will give you a very good idea about the manufacturing and the appearance of these pellets. And I will also forward to you uh, some important review notes which I have downloaded and which will help you to understand this topic in a much better manner and be ready for your exams. Best of luck. Thank you.